How would you like to be totally alone on a dark and broken down planet for 1,000 years? The Bible tells us about a time like this. Stay with us as we explore God's Word. Greetings, dear friends. My name is Marvin Clark. And I'm Judy Clark. And together, we're going to look at a topic about the thousand-year time period, beginning with the first resurrection and ending with the second resurrection. It's called the millennium and the end of sin. We look forward to a lot of things, going to see our children, uh, taking a vacation maybe after your school's out, a lot of things we look forward to. But do you know that there's something right before us, Judy, that is the most incredible thing in the universe from start to finish? And that is a thousand years with Jesus in his kingdom with those that want to be with him for eternity. Hallelujah. Yeah, you say hallelujah, <laughs> and I don't blame you. What a day that will be. The topic today, the millennium and the thousand years with Jesus <laughs> in his kingdom. And that day is soon to come. It is right around the corner, I believe. Now, many people are, are expecting, Judy, that the thousand-year millennium time period will take place on this earth. That's a very popular uh, idea today. But I think you'll see when we get done with this program that the thousand-year time period, the millennium, actually will take place in God's kingdom. Now, the amazing thing is that this deception, this uh, wrong picture of the millennium was exactly the viewpoint that the uh, religious leaders and the Jews had at the time of Christ. They expected that God was going to set up a, an earthly uh, millennium. And they were rushing him to get with the program and place himself on the throne as the king. But Jesus told them, hey, wait a minute. My kingdom is not of this world. <laughs> My kingdom is a kingdom somewhere else. And that's exactly what we're looking at with this thousand-year reign of Jesus and his people in heaven. Jesus had just fed the 5,000. He did a most incredible miracle. And when he was done, the religious leaders and his Jewish friends that, that were witnessing the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, the multiplying of the fish and the loaves, as soon as he was done doing that, they grabbed him and were trying to put him on the throne to make him king because with him as king, everybody had it made. If any of their soldiers got killed in a battle, he would heal them immediately. If they got killed, he'd raise them up. If they got wounded, he'd touch them and they'd be all well. So they were anxious. They were ready for him to be king on this earth. But again, that was not his plan. And we're going to find out what his plan was and is as we go along here. We're going to lay out the sequence of events that will begin and end that thousand-year reign of Christ and his children in his kingdom. This is one of the greatest events in history, and again, it's right upon us. Judy, if you would read the incredible promise of Jesus here. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Can you think of a better promise? Can you think of a more promising promise? Mm. What a future we have just based upon that alone. We get to spend eternity with the one that made us. We get to spend eternity with our best friend, and that's Jesus. And most of my friends believe, as you and I believe, that this event is soon to come, maybe right around the corner. The second coming of Jesus Christ. What an incredible day that will be. 
Are you ready for it? <laughs> are you ready for him? He's ready for you. And doesn't that journey start here and today and at this moment? We should be building a relationship with him that carries us through. And that means that at this very moment, all we have to do is ask Jesus to come and be our best friend, one whom we can trust with anything and everything. And we can be experiencing just a slight portion of his coming each and every day. And then when that great majestic appearance occurs, we recognize who he is and we know who he is because he's our best friend. That's it. It, it is those who have done that. It is those who are doing that those who have established a relationship with Jesus Christ, a friendship basis, who will be ready when he comes. It doesn't matter then when he comes. He could come tomorrow or in, or in 10 years. They'll be ready because they already have him as their friend. And that's what it takes to get in. Is Jesus your best friend? Then you've got it made. If he's not your best friend, get to know him. Because the Bible says to know him is to have eternal life. Well, there it is. Now, Judy, when Jesus does return and take us home with him, he'll raise up from the dead those who love him and want to live with him for eternity. So second coming, the fulfillment of that promise you just read from John 14, at the second coming is the first resurrection of the two resurrections when God's people will be raised up out of the grave or out of the deep blue seas if they drowned on a ship and sunk to the bottom and got eaten by sharks. It doesn't matter. He's going to put that body back together and make it like his glorious body. And it will be immortal. That means that person will live as long as God lives. Now, as we said, this is the first resurrection. At the second coming, there are two. If you would read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 15 to 18, we're going to get a very clear picture of how this resurrection works. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I, th I think of all the people, Judy, in the last 32 years that by the grace of God, I've been able to comfort with those words because they lost a loved one. And I was asked to do the funeral service or the memorial service. And what a comfort those words are. I have also done services, hate to talk about it, but I've done services because it's true, for people who have no hope. They have zero hope because they don't understand this, this concept. They don't know Jesus as their friend. And when they say goodbye to a loved one in their mind, in their heart, it is a permanent goodbye. Oh, my if they only knew Jesus and the hope we have of the second coming and that first resurrection. People, you want to be in the first resurrection, not the second resurrection. We want to be in the first resurrection. Revelation chapter 20, verse 5 says it this way. This is the first resurrection, and blessed and, ho and holy is he that has a part in the first resurrection because they're the ones that are going to be taken to heaven with Jesus for eternity. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, it speaks of those who will be resurrected at the first resurrection. It says, they'll live and they'll reign with Christ, verse 4, for a thousand years. Then in verse 5 it says, if you'd read that for us, Judy. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. There it is. 
the place to be if you die before Jesus comes is in that first resurrection. He'll come the second time, he'll raise up the dead, and we will be transported with him into the kingdom and we'll live there as long as God lives. What a thought. Immortal. So, the Bible clearly speaks of two resurrections. Listen to what Jesus says about these two resurrections. This is Jesus speaking now. John chapter 5. All that are in their graves will hear his voice, and they shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, but they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Two resurrections, you want to be in the first resurrection. And by the grace of God, you will be if Jesus is your best friend. So, the second coming and the first resurrection begins the 1,000-year reign with Christ in heaven. And the second resurrection takes place at the close of the 1,000 years that we spend with Jesus in heaven. The resurrection of the righteous begins the 1,000-year time period. The resurrection of the wicked ends the 1,000-year millennium time period. By the way, what happens to the uh, wicked who are uh, alive when Jesus comes the second time? We're waiting for the second coming right now. We know what happens to the people who love Jesus. They're raised up out of their graves and taken to God's kingdom. What happens to the wicked who are um, alive and, and see the return of Jesus? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 will answer this question. And Judy, if you have that. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Why doesn't God just save everybody? Good question. Yeah, that's a valid question. Many have asked that. First of all, you saw how the wicked are destroyed, did you not? They're destroyed by the brightness of his coming, by his glory. God is so pure and so holy that he shines forth with uh, what the Bible calls a fire. It's a destroying fire for those who cling to sin, but it doesn't hurt those who love him and have said goodbye to sin and hello to Jesus. So, Judy asked a good question, and that is, um, why doesn't God just go ahead and, and save everybody? Why does he exclude some people from eternity, from heaven? Very good question. Let me ask it this way. Um, Judy, would you feel, let me answer it this way. Would you feel comfortable being involved in a drug cartel in Colombia? Think about it for a minute and then... Oh, you, I don't even it doesn't a take It doesn't no. take you a minute. You said <laughs> no. immediately, no, 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 I wouldn't. No. Okay. Why no. not? All kinds of emotions would be involved in that yeah. one. Yeah. And first and foremost would be security and safety. There'd be fear would be the giant word. Those people live by fear. They operate machine guns all day long. They kill people. They do shady uh, drug deals. They steal money and... You have not done any of that. You are not going to do any of that. And you never will do any of that. It's not you. And it's not I. I couldn't either. So we would feel totally out of place in a Colombian drug cartel. We couldn't wait to get out of there. Guess what? <laughs> People who don't love Jesus and don't operate according to his Ten Commandment plan by choice, they would feel the same way if they were forced to be in heaven that Judy and I would feel if we were forced to be in a drug cartel in Colombia. We would hate it. Anybody would. Because their heart is not in the right place. Their thinking is not in the right place. They have not even come to love each other or love Jesus. So heaven would be, hang on to your seats, heaven would be 
a place of torture for them. So God is doing the kindest, the most just thing he can do by keeping them out of his kingdom and not forcing them in. Make sense? Makes yeah? sense. Okay. Now, we're with Jesus for a thousand years in heaven. That, takes, that begins at the second coming. Uh, what happens to Satan during this time? We're in heaven. Dead people that don't love Jesus aren't there with us by choice. But where's Satan during this thousand year time period? Revelation 20, 1 to 3 answers this. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he lay hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. The passage you just read, Judy, says that the enemy, Satan, is going to be bound. He's going to be chained and thrown into a bottomless pit for that thousand-year time period. Now, what in the world is this bottomless pit? The word for bottomless pit in the original Greek is abusos or abyss. The same word is used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 in the Greek version of the Old Testament in connection with the creation of this world. But there it is translated by the word deep. So, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Bottomless pit, abusos. The words deep and bottomless pit and abyss here refer to the same thing. The earth and its totally dark, disorganized form before God made order of it. So, where is Satan bound? Where is he chained up? On this earth. You know, I shared this with some students in, in a uh, group setting one time and just a few days ago because they were bringing this up when they were reading Revelation together in our little group time. And they said, I'm sure glad Jesus doesn't invite him to the party. Yeah. And I said, well, why, why do you say that? And they said, because he wouldn't be happy there, and neither would we. So we're glad that he's here, and we get to be with Jesus, so we can be totally happy and totally free. That's neat. You know, right after that discussion you had with your students, you happened to mention to me that uh, you were uh, discussing this theme of the thousand years, and we talked about, you and I talked about Satan being chained up, and you said, hey, wait a minute. I shared that with my children in the classroom, and they came up with a very interesting concept. What was that? Well, the interesting concept was is that there's nobody here for him to uh, talk with or deceive or uh, communicate with, and so he's all alone, so he's pretty much chained himself. And that is that he's here with nobody to even communicate with. So rather than the chaining be a, a literal chain, the, the being chained up is actually being chained by circumstances. Exactly. As you just said, there's nobody here with him. Mm -hmm. He is spending 1,000 years on this planet without people to deceive, and his middle name is Deceiver. And just think how miserable he's going to be with just him and his evil angels with him. Nobody on this earth to deceive for 1,000 years. So the chain is symbolic, and Satan is really bound by a, a chain of circumstances. We might understand that fairly easily here uh, when we say something like this. Uh, I can't come and be with you right now because I'm all tied up. Well, <laughs> am I literally tied up with ropes? No. I'm tied up by circumstances, and my circumstances won't allow me to go do what you want me to do and be with you. So we can understand the chaining of Satan is a symbolic chaining. 
It just means he is miserable. He would love to be deceiving people, and there's nobody left to deceive. Uh, the wicked are all dead, and the righteous are all in heaven, so the poor guy is on a time out. And Judy, when I mention the word time out, I'm hitting a familiar chord with you <laughs> because I've never seen you spank uh, a child your own or anybody else's, but I have seen you give them time out. And Satan is going to have a 1,000 year time out. What does a time out do to, you, to your children? What kind of a punishment is that? I've even in the classroom given myself a time out and I tell the kids, teacher needs a time out. I'll be back with you in a moment. Yeah. And they'll go, shh, she needs a time out. <laughs> time out just means you need quiet time to reflect on choices. What was your choice? So what would be the consequence of that choice? Do you feel at peace from your choice? Or do you feel really worked up and angry? And maybe you need a time out to reflect on your choice. And that itself sometimes gives us back that sense of balance that we need. And God's spirit can speak to us and we can redirect and get going again. So we call them little uh, quiet sessions or timeouts or some say go to Australia. Uh, some teachers do use a, a place like that. But a place where they don't feel threatened but safe to just take time and rest. Pretty neat. So as you teach young children uh, some of these biblical concepts, which are fairly deep, and this is a fairly deep one, pretty heavy stuff. Uh, maybe they could understand Satan being chained by circumstances because of the wrong choices he has made if you call it a timeout. Yes. All right. Yes. They can certainly understand that. And you know, I want to encourage um, you to take time to not go around these topics with children, but to address it with children. They are so ready to hear truth. And they are so ready for the book of Revelation. I am amazed at younger and younger children that are now migrating in the Bible to Revelation and saying, teacher, what does this mean? Why is this here? Oh, I get it. This And they're teaching me what it means. Because when they you introduce them to God and you introduce them to Jesus and who he is, you can tackle anything in this word. And children can gain a closer walk with their God when we... Let them know that there is nothing in here that we are going to hide from them, that this is God's holy word. That is really neat. And, and I wonder, Judy, if as we get closer to the end, closer to the second coming and the first resurrection and the chaining of Satan, the binding of Satan to this earth, if the Holy Spirit is going to work with these young people and help them understand some concepts that are deep, and maybe prior to this have been uh, kind of unknown to them. Today's young people are introduced so much into games that um, they interact with that have some basis sometimes that reflect revelation and conflict. And when you get them into God's word addressing these scenarios, they're going, whoa, that's not right. And then they step back and go, but it is right. And they themselves pull away from the offensive non-truth and migrate towards what they know is biblical truth. And we should not steer from this because it's our responsibility to mold and guide these children. And what better place than in God's holy word? What better place than the word of God? Absolutely. Let's take a look at the events that occur at the beginning of the 1,000 year millennium. Here it is. The second coming of Jesus for his children. Christians who died are raised to life. Christians are given immortality. Christians are given bodies like Jesus, Philippians 3.21. Christians are caught up in the clouds with Jesus who takes them to his home, our new home. The wicked who are alive when Jesus returns will be destroyed, now we know how, by the brightness of his coming, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. The wicked dead remain dead until the end of the thousand years. Jesus takes his children home with him to heaven. 
And Satan, again, is bound and confined to this earth. Revelation 20, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, this is amazing. Judy, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, speaks of a judgment in heaven. A judgment taking place during the thousand years. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, says that the saved saints will judge the world and even angels. What's up with that? Here's what's up with that. There's going to be people in heaven who we didn't think would be there. We, we look at the person and say, how in the world did he get here? How in the world did she get here? And there'll also be people who are not in heaven whom we thought would be there. And so we're judging them in the sense that God gives us the record books and we're able to see behind the scenes and look at the person's life totally and completely with a bright light shining on it and, de and, and see exactly why the person is there that we didn't think would be there or the person is not there that we thought would be there. In that sense, we're judging angels because we're going to do it with the angels that went, went sour, that went bad, and sided with Satan, and we're going to do it with all of our friends that we wonder why they're there or why they're not there. And some people are probably asking how we got there. That's exactly what they're going to do. Marvin, <laughs> how in the world did you get here? <laughs> we looked at the events that occur at the beginning of the thousand years. Let's review the events that occurred during the thousand years. Here's what's going on during this 1,000 year time period. The earth is in a total blackout. Satan and his angels are on the earth. The saved are in heaven with Jesus, judging those who were not there or who got there and we didn't think they would be there. And the wicked are all dead. Jeremiah 4, 25, Isaiah 11, verse 4. There it is. 1,000 years of incredible peace and love and joy, living with Jesus for eternity, being with Judy, being with our loved ones who have gone before us in the sleep of death. Right across the road from our church where we work, there's a cemetery, Judy. In that cemetery is a little 10-year-old girl that got cancer, and we watched her be buried, and there she is. People like that, I want to see them again. I can't wait to see them again. What a day that will be to see them again. And you can see them again, your loved ones who have gone before you in the sleep of death. You can be there with them for eternity. Make Jesus your best friend, and you're in, because it's in the Bible.